men today. Uh, Dr. Lang is um, doing some extensive hard work in Hawaii. Yeah, she's just suffering, y'all. She's suffering. But we're, today's topic, we're going to talk about all of this crime, violence, uh, everything is up and spiking. And the three wise men are going to talk about, you know, some remedies we can do to make things better. Now, as usual, we got to pay some bills. So I'm going to see you all in two minutes, two seconds. Okay, we're out. All right. Uh, Dr. Sharif, uh, what is your uh, match jig? Okay, he's Dr. Sharif is frozen. Run this long a little bit, give the rabbi a couple of seconds. Yep, you got it. All right, Dr. Sharif, what's the name of your uh, mosque? Uh, Mr. Muhammad Nation's Mosque. Okay. That's in Washington or? Yes, yes, Washington, D.C. Yeah. Rabbi, you've been doing this for a year, three months, and what? That's a total of uh, 43 episodes that you've been doing this. What do you mean by this? <laughs> I emailed you the link. Uh, let's get this party started. If you, I'm going to text it to you right now. He's usually the first one on asking me all kinds of questions. Oh, boy. What do you guys think? They're going after Roe v. Wade. Oh, don't get, don't let me get started. You're going to ask that oh, question right now. Listen, uh, abortion is one of the biggest killers of the black community. Man, listen, uh, we need we need all the lives we can get. So uh, if this brief, if this uh, opinion becomes uh, uh, a legal document, you know, like the, the law, then it's going to be up to the states. And uh, that's where that's where the fight's going to begin. Yeah, but let's look at it. Yeah, uh, abortion is the leading killer of African Americans. No, yep. no doubt about it. Part of the agenda. Part of the reason why it was government financed. Yeah, well, thanks to Margaret Sanger, she uh, did a good job. Uh, well, and we're talking about Margaret Sanger, a woman who um, studied under the German classism of of selective breeding. Only right. the best and brightest were able or allowed to breed to uh, produce the best and brightest children. So everybody else that was not in her consideration of class should be aborted. That's and that's yeah, that's what she thought. And, you know, that Maslow's hierarchy, you know, survival of the fit that thing. I mean, look, all of us. That's why we're here mm -hmm. to help everybody. Can't we don't we're not God. <laughs> so let's, um, you know. OK, let Abortions. Did you want me to come legal. in, Vincent? Are you are you ready to come in, or did you want to wait yeah. for the rabbi? Yeah, we'll come in. When he comes in, he comes in. Uh, okay, uh, right, uh, I'm going to transition you now. Okay, uh, uh, you can count it down. We're just going to talk because people who are seeing us streaming have been here listening to us anyway. It's just <laughs> you guys are in. You guys okay. are alive. So okay, but let's look at it. Um, abortions only became legal because white. Eastern doctors got tired of midwives making all of that money, and then they deemed the midwives' technique as unsafe, uh, unsanitized, and they didn't have the capability or knowledge in the event that anything went wrong. Where midwives have been doing abortion since what? The Stone Ages? Well, even if they have, I mean, it's still a life, and we don't, 
uh, get to make that determination. Only God does. Oh, true that. True that. That's, yeah. that's it. You know, I mean, and I, and I get the outliers, you know, the reasons why. But uh, I look at how many doctors, lawyers, how many politicians uh, have we, you know, we, we taken out of circulation because of, uh, you've got the outliers, okay, rape, incest, okay, we get that, right? But that's not the general uh, mass number of people who are getting abortions. It's those who um, make decisions and then regret their decisions. And uh, so don't blame the baby for it. No, they do blame the baby. but okay. uh, Exactly, right? <laughs> They, they do blame the baby. I mean, we've got trifling men who get women pregnant and said that I don't have any choice or, or they don't consult me in terms of if she's going to keep it or not. Or right. with most of them are trifling and, and don't just want to have the woman to have an abortion anyway. You've right. got, okay, on the same thing, you've got women who, you know, just get pregnant because they think it's a way to keep the man, you know, and then once they find out that, you know what, that doesn't keep him, that makes him run faster. Now they want an abortion. And you've got some who are just trifling, who don't want to do anything like take precautions, uh, contraceptives, uh, birth control. Right, right. No, it's no, no. Their, their, their birth control is, oh, I'm pregnant. Well, let me get an abortion. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. I mean, you know, we uh, we've got strong black men and women who need to be on this earth right now. Uh, as, as all of us have traveled around, you know, there's enough land for everybody. There's enough opportunities for everybody. Uh, maybe some stuff that uh, could have been developed hadn't been developed because of uh, our heart. Our heart is is deceitful and wicked and we want our own way. But we're not God. We, we can't make that call. That's a God call. He could create life. He's the only one that can take it, uh, barring, you know. You know. Pastor, yeah. is it deceitful and wicked to just say, I'm sick and tired of these women going around with one kid on the left, one kid on the right, one kid in a stroller, and my mm. tax dollars is paying for it? Man, you know, I, I guess it goes back to what you said. I want the guys to stand up. I want men to stand up and take responsibility. Uh, this is on our shoulders. Um, me, I've got three boys, uh, one daughter, and, and I teach my boys to be responsible men. And uh, so I can't speak for all of them, but then I've got to be an example for those that don't live in my household. Um, you know, we can't go back from the beginning and change it, but we can start where we are now going forward. That's my position. Okay. Well, let's look at let, let, let's look at a, another thing. Um, responsibility is one, but here is a huge obstacle that these politicians are going to have to deal with. Now, they've been trying to load conservative judges for the specific reason of coming after Roe v. Wade. We have given women exceptoraneous rights and privileges by saying it's her body, her choice. Once you give somebody something, you go, you got a hell of a fight to take it away. Oh, yeah. You, you don't give anything. Uh, Imam, I don't want us to crowd this conversation. I know you got some wisdom over there. Um, but I, uh, yeah, it's hard to, to, to take away something that you give. And that's why we would fight tooth and nail uh, over it. You know, um, so I think we're in for uh, we're in for a fight. I think we're in for you know a, a long uh, uh, you know time of, of de debate, um, and I think conversations that need to be had around it should happen face to face, not on social media. They should happen one on one in in living rooms, you know, in churches, in in mosques, in synagogues, where you can see each other face to face and have uh, dialogue. I mean, that's the only way we're going to solve this problem. What about those people of faith, pastor, imam, rabbi? Mm -hmm. We know people in faith who sit there at, at the time of the gathering and will not address that issue, sidestep the issue, and preach Peter, John, and Mark. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> Well, well, I think definitely, you know, you, you've got the crowd that says, don't talk about issues, just talk about Jesus. I, I got it. I, I get it. 
Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, and so, but sometimes you have to, you know, to make an egg, to make an omelet, you got to crack a few eggs. That's my position. So uh, we're called to speak truth. And the truth hurts. It cuts either way. It doesn't just cut the other person. The truth cuts those that are giving the truth just as much as those who are receiving it because nobody is righteous. All of us have sinned, all fall short. So um, I think it is our due diligence, our duty to speak truth, whether it cuts us. And, uh, you know, people of, people of faith aren't perfect. You know, a lot of them have issues of, you know, uh, assisted in abortion, you know, convincing people to do hold it. On, I mean, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Pastor, you said people of faith, faith aren't perfect? Yep. Want to see my shock face? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's the reality. That's the reality. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back. I'm Vincent Squire with my three wise men, my co-host for the day, uh, Pastor Reverend Jonathan Leaf. I also have Doctor the Ima Talib uh, Talib Sharif, and of course, as always, one of our favorite wise men, Rabbi Seth Frisch. Now. We're going to find out if somebody's calling us from their Obama phone. They can't get the link right. But we're going to come back in and we're going to dive into some heavy subjects today, dealing with uh, some faith issues and all of this violence that we've got going on. And I'll see you all. Two minutes, two seconds. Okay, we're out. Okay. Now, I saw people come on and then cut out. Uh, Iman, are you with us? <clears throat> Looks like Imam's having some connection issues. Um, Rabbi Seth Frisch has no visual. Looks like which it won't it won't play without a visual. Oh boy, Rabbi. Okay, okay, everyone, if you can hear me, just uh, log out, then log back in. Let's see if that'll change it. Okay, let's see who we just leave. Uh, Looks like Ima might be having some connection problems. Um, maybe if he goes on the Wi-Fi as opposed to, it looks like he's using a um, 4G or 5G to log in on his phone. All right. You can see, you can tell all that. Yeah. Well, if it, above each person, if you look on the left-hand side, each one of us has a connection status. Imam's is very low. The okay, rest of us are all bright green. His is low. So I can't actually tell, but I just assume that it's some kind of slow connection of some kind. I got you. But a lot of people, when they're on their cell phone, they it, it, it works, but for streaming, it can be kind of shoddy. Okay. Rabbi, you got to connect your camera. Iman, the same thing for you. Can you guys talk? I heard somebody. Rabbi, you might have to go into your settings. It looks like I'm not getting any audio for you. Yeah, we can see the private channel. Um, so Oops. go if you see right below the chat. Um, there is a settings option. All the way to the right, looks like a little gear. You're gonna click on settings and then you're gonna go under audio. And we're looking for audio input. You have to just set up your microphone for the audio input. If you're on a cell phone, it should automatically do it for you. But if you're on your computer, you might have to adjust some settings. Okay, Iman, you were in and then you were out. What happened? His connection's much better now, Iman. Maybe he's ad adjusting something. Yeah. You're like in the 60s when you had the rabbit ear antenna, you had to go put one hand on the antenna and put the other hand near the window. Oh, <laughs> we just, my dad had me to stand there and be like, hold your left leg up. <laughs> 
My dad had me hold the left leg up and the right arm. <laughs> dad, dad, I gotta stay like this forever. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hello, handsome. Can uh, okay, uh, I think you gotta tell, turn one of them off. Your phone, your I got it. I got it. Should be good now. Okay, okay Chad's got it. Um, so, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. It might be because uh, it might be playing out loud from whatever device you're using. Well, I, um, I just switched over to my, uh, smartphone as it were, because it was not coming on as you were directing me on the computer. So maybe that's something you and I could talk about at another point. Oh, uh, Rabbi, how many of these shows have you done now? Well, it's a different, this is a different thing, young Vincent. <laughs> Young Vincent, <laughs> as I as I as, as I vastly approach sixty, thank you. <laughs> you know, you may vastly approach sixty, but you have not vastly approached the age of understanding yet. Oh wow! Ooh, so what you're saying? I'm old and stupid. I mean, is that what? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many more miles of. <laughs> All right, Rabbi, I'm just going to take you off the list for that Father's Day gift I was sending. Okay. It was a you good one, Father's too. Hey, what's the name of this channel? Uh, What you got to say. All right, you guys ready to come back? We've been on quite a break. Yes. Uh, see okay. what you can do texting the uh, uh, imam to get him back. Okay, I, I, I don't have imam's information. Okay. Uh, give me a couple of seconds, and I'll uh, before you bring us back, and I'll send you his info. Okay. <clears throat> How are you, Rabbi? You're very, I, I uh, you're very much so missed. <laughs> uh, exactly by that. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ooh, I can hear don't, you. Don't blow his head Please. up. No, I do. I do miss him, though. I do miss the Rabbi. It's it's been tough without him. I miss him. Well, don't all blow I have to his say. Head up. I now that he knows he's got fans, oh, it's going to be over for us. I don't know. I... Okay. Is everybody ready? I just sent it to you, Chad, so you can communicate okay. with him on text. All right, you got it. I'll shoot him a text message. I'm going to count you guys down from five, stopping at three, live in five, four, three. Okay, so we're working through the technical issues, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, for those of you, uh, YouTube, what you got to say. Uh, Facebook, what you got to say. And Channel 190, Comcast, what you got to say, TV. Okay, so now I had some conversations with uh, Pastor Jonathan Lee. And, of course, as always, our other wise one, Rabbi Seth Frisch is joined in. And we're going to do, our producer is doing everything he can to get Iman, Dr. Talib Sharif back on. So, um, real quick, introduce yourself, uh, Pastor Leaf. Hi, my name is Jonathan Leaf. I'm the co-pastor of Converge Church in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, married, have four children, and uh, my daughter's birthday is today. She's 20, so she's my oldest, and I've got uh, uh, three other boys running around eating up all my food. Uh, I am, uh, I'm currently in a PhD program. I don't think you knew this, Vincent. I'm getting my doctorate in strategic leadership. So, um, I'm hitting the books, be writing dissertation real soon, but, uh, excited to be here. Um, and, uh, love the lively discussion. Well, mine's is on, uh, church management. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Thank I've got my dissertation coming in. Can't you see the bloodshot eyes from lack of oh, sleep? Yeah. Uh, hey, what happens? That's what happens. <laughs> yes. And uh, Rabbi Seth Frisch, New Shahol of America. How are you, sir? Good. You? Introduce glad yourself to here. those new. Today. I'm glad to be here with the pastor today, and I look forward to seeing the imam. My name is Rabbi Seth Frisch, and following in that tradition, I have three children, uh, the oldest of which is studying to be a rabbi from the Orthodox. Of, of Judaism, and uh, my wife is, and I'm a conservative, so we're trying to hedge all our bets in the greater department of Jew of the Jewish religion. Oh boy! 
said all that. I, now, in our second or third year, Vincent, of being a, a member of this team, and it's always, it's lively, it's interesting, it's in-depth, and I'm just very humbled and proud to be here with you today. So uh, thank you so much. Oh, and to Pastor, I just want to say mazel tov to your daughter on, on the achievement of yet another birthday. Many more to come. Many more. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. And sure. we're waiting. Sure. And uh, uh, Iman, Dr. Talib uh, Sharif uh, will be joining us as soon as we can get his uh, camera back on. So uh, we talked earlier about the situation with uh, abortion. The Supreme Court's right now, and there's a docket on, that's going to happen with Roe v. Wade with the Republican judge or uh, justices up there, more than likely Roe is going to die a horrible death. Hmm. But the strange thing about it is that the woman who was the, uh, who, who, well, her real name wasn't Roe, she turned uh, Christian about maybe 30 years ago and confessed that it was all a lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we know what they say. If it doesn't come out in the wash, it comes out, it in, comes the out in the rinse. <laughs> Were your parents and my parents related? <laughs> oh, it could have been. <laughs> they could have been. <laughs> okay. So, been. COVID. Two years. Um, now, Dr. Fauci says that we are out of the pandemic stage. And that brought about a tailspin. Now, we've went through two plus years of disinformation, misinformation, not knowing what was true and what was right. And Dr. Fauci sparked some crazy stuff up by saying that we're on a pandemic stage. And then the White House came back and now he had to walk the whole explanation of what he said back. What's are people that eager to get this over with or are we just looking to hear what we want to hear well you might think that uh, there's a there's a long history of people in the white house agreeing with dr fauci and concomitantly there's a long history of dr fauci changing his mind about things that he says vis-a-vis -vis the political winds and i'm not trying to cast versions on his integrity i'm sure it's quite good but we have received so many conflicting reports about the beginnings, the middle, and the quote unquote end of this COVID variety or varieties that I'm beginning to have doubts myself about what is really the truth. And, and I'm, a, I'm a purveyor of the truth. I'm, I'm a receptor of the truth. I want to know the truth. And, and I feel that um, COVID's getting a bum's rush. People are trying to rush it out the door long before it's. Uh, Long before it's supposed to go. That's oh, that's yeah. my thing. Re remember, it's going away. We've got 15 cases going on zero. <laughs> I don't know what's more disturbing to me, the COVID or that just reenactment of some yeah. thing. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, so I won't win an Emmy for my 45 impersonations. But, uh, but okay, so... And, and walking it back, Dr. Fauci, and, and, and correct me here, but I've always found Fauci to be a straight shooter. In fact, he's been the only well, one of very few who have said, you know, came out and said, you know, publicly, I was wrong about this, and this is where the facts seem to be leading us. Well, I'm not, I don't hear him say that he's wrong too much. I do hear him putting licking his finger and putting it up in the wind and see which way the wind is blowing. You know, Vincent, I, I earlier time, I'm much older than you are. And uh, I remember uh, there was a famous Dylan song um, that uh, had a line, you don't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind is blowing. And uh, I do get that impression. I, I'm not a purveyor of the Students for the Democratic Society, but I am one who doubts government official spokesmen telling me what the government wants to hear. And, and, I, I, and you and I have had this discussion before, and I think it's important for us to understand the truth is out there. Sorry to be an X Factor acolyte here, but the truth is out there somewhere. I just don't know where the truth is right now. I'm going to tell you something else. Right. This pandemic is not over. People are still being admitted to hospitals. People are still dying. And in certain population centers, 
even with people with booster shots, people are still being admitted and dying and, and, and put away. So let's, let's remember there is a truth and, and we have not gotten it yet. That part is true. And Dr. Fauci said in, in his second statement, he said, no, people are still catching COVID and people are still dying, but we're not getting hundreds of thousands of cases a day, nor are we getting tens of thousands of deaths a day. I mean, two years ago, we were looking at the news and that death toll was ticking like you were watching somebody on the Hunger Games. Okay, so, so tell me one thing here. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm coming at this from the perspective of somebody who's got children, got family, friends, they congregate according to the rules. They're allowed to congregate. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to attend super spreader events. Yeah, I said that. They're okay. allowed to do all the things because the COVID is supposedly no longer there. But I think we all can admit it's here. Even people getting their shots and their boosters and wearing masks, it's here. Why can't we, all of us, created in the image of the living God. Why can't we get the living truth about what is out there? Why does okay, it have guys, to be? Don't, don't, don't let I me suck up to... all the oxygen. What do you guys think? Uh, oh, by the way, uh, welcome uh, uh, Iman Dr. Talib Bashir from, um, let me get this right, America's Mosque in Washington, DC. Dr. Sharif? I think he just uh, left. Yeah, he left. You know, let I me, mean, uh, let me. Introduction, but go ahead. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> Rabbi, I think, you know, unfortunately, the truth is expensive. That's amazing. Uh, lies are free. They don't cost anything. You know, you, they're, you can, they're a dime a dozen, but truth seems to be, it, it seems to come at a high cost. And the reality is, is that. percent. Yeah. percent. Yeah. So, I'll, so. You know, one, one thing, according to that, that just that one comment, you know, the truth leads a wretched life. Yes, it you does. Know, but it leads a very wretched life. But that's in concert with what you just said. I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, th this was this was wow. So December 2019, my niece is over. She she goes to uh, she's at Duke University. And they have an exchange program with a research or they were doing research or doing doing some training in the Wuhan province of, of China. So we get this email that, hey, something's happening. We have to get my niece out of China like quick. And so she barely gets in right before Christmas. And she was telling, hey, something's going on. Something's going on. I mean, they were like shutting things down. And she came here. And then three months later, you know, the world stops. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I think with COVID, the reality is that we're we're in a we're in a mess. We're in a pickle, and if there was truth, hey, there's a vaccine out here. It may work. It may not. If you're very healthy, the likelihood of it being uh, that effective, the efficacy may not be as high. But if you have some pre-existing conditions, then this is what you need to do. So govern yourselves accordingly, right? Don't mand Don't make it mandatory. Uh, don't don't do all these you know, these hoops and, 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 um, and dog whistles, because, you know, one of the things about Americans, boy, you know, we fight for our freedom. <laughs> I mean, you tell us no, and we're looking for, uh-oh, now you want to fight, you know? So um, let's get ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, this was radical, you know, uh, to, to take that approach, but I, I have to follow grace. We were scared. Nobody knew what to do. So, um, yeah, I think it's very it's very scary to put out mandates when you're still trying to figure things out. Right. What, what well, you know, I love that the, 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 the now dominant strand isn't as deadly. Right? How do you know? How yeah. do you know that? How because do you know that? Hospitalization but, and death tolls have dropped. The government told you it's not that. Deadly. How do you know? And before you answer that, take a gulp of air. And let's remember that the African American community was experimented on, right, and lied to by right. the United States government. Let's remember that. Let's take that gulp of air and remember: How do you know who told, you and is it the truth? You know, one, one of the one of the things you know people were saying: you know, trust science, trust science. 
But what does science do? Science questions everything. So you're telling me to trust science, so I'm doing it. But no, you're saying it's mandatory. You got to do it. But then you just tell me to trust science. Science questions everything. It throws out hypothesis. It's got to test if see if this is true. It's got a way that can't run. Uh, so if you're saying trust science, that's what a lot of people were doing. But there was this authoritarian kind of push, uh, and it had to do with uh, you know unfortunately the economics were tied into it. Uh, you know, uh, we're now facing inflation. That was, I mean, I, I've in my lifetime, I mean, I was, pro I'm, I'm 50 years old. So I think they're saying around like the 70s, this was inflation numbers, you know, or, or Reaganomics, this inflation. Like, this is crazy. This is crazy. So, um, again, I think that it was just the, 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 the suddenness of it. We didn't know what to do. And then when you start to say these are mandatory, you're just, it's a recipe for disaster. Okay, the government didn't make anything mandatory except for people in the government. And there is well, a Supreme, but there is a Supreme Court precedent of, of mandatory vaccination. And, and this, this is one of the most brilliant things one of the chief justices said. He said, and I quote, every man has a civil liberty, his right of happiness. However, if his right of happiness impedes upon the lives of others, then mandates have to be in place for the greater good of the many, rather than the liberties and freedom of the few. So jobs, yeah, but... jobs can mandate that if you want to work here and get a paycheck, you got to get your COVID shot. Right. But well, then uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, lawsuits, you know, pending on uh, unfair discrimination of uh, uh, firing practices and, and hiring and firing and, 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 you know, so I, I, I get it. I get well, it. I, so, yes. so you're saying because, you know, most of the people of color or who, who got their jobs or whatever the case may be, have their shots. So you're saying that a great deal of uh, white Americans are going to start suing their jobs for discrimination because they didn't get their shots. Well, I'm all saying, I gotta I'm say to saying. women, welcome to my world of discrimination. <laughs> hey, I'll show you the secret handshake. <laughs> welcome, welcome to my house, right? That, um, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you were discriminated? Oh, oh, you 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 ain't get your shot. Oh, you just suffering, y'all suffering. Right, right, right. That that's yeah. That's I mean, hey, I mean, I can't. Touche. Oh, can't, by the way, <laughs> Rabbi, to answer your question, how do we know? Well, two things. One, they ran the test, you know, the lab scope and the little, you know, uh, 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 Petri dish. Right. And they looked at the potency of the actual uh, new variant versus the alpha and the delta variant. And they found it to be weaker, not as many per, per center or, or, or droplet. Then they also looked at the decline in hospitalization the decline in, 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 in people contracting it. And we're talking about a decline where now cities have test sites and cars are lined up for miles. And, and mm -hmm. it's down where there was no test sites and, and, and the contraction rate was up. You know, there's, uh, uh, I'll throw this out there. This may not be, I'm just throwing it out there. You know, the placebo effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mind over matter. You know, like, hey, if I think I'm well, I can be well, right? Um, and if I think I'm sick, I'm going to be sick. You know, I think doctors in their residency, they say that a lot of doctors, uh, they self-diagnose with these pathologies as they're studying them through their rotations. And if they're talking about a certain symptom, they're like, oh, I feel that, you know. So not to say that that's what it is, but I think um, that, you know, that's out there. Um, but but I will say this, um, the, 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 the quickness in which, the vaccine was developed. Uh, it was only quick because there was already research being done and there was already vaccines out there. There were already some, some vaccines that, that already showed uh, a positive um, effects of, you know, uh, uh, combating the virus. And so it was just a matter of adding a few tweaks to it, but the basis is there. And so I remember I did a message on, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this pandemic and epidemic and how how it becomes, uh, you know, how it, how it grows. An epi, epidemic is happening in one place. Pandemic is when it crosses over a sort of defined territory. So now we've got a pandemic, uh, but now uh, they're saying we have an endemic, right? Which uh, says that, okay, this thing is here to stay. 
and let's just get used to it. Um, I heard one uh, uh, individual say, and I think it may have been backed up with some research, that they'll be will be required to do multiple vaccines every six months, whatever that is. Uh, but I'll tell you, my parents down in North Carolina, they are like lining up to get it. They're like, we're on, we're we're we're, we're scheduled to do it. My mom is sort of coordinating caravans to go get the booster shots. But um, but I think that you know, I mean, it, it's it's what it is. America, we've never faced this. This is not just America. This is the global. Well, way as, as people of faith, as purveyors of faith, what's yeah. our takeaway? We can talk about what's in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, what's right. coming out, who to trust, what to, we can do all that. And we're right. just we're we're just lay commenters on things because it's not our field. But right. our field, our, our life, our lives are as people of faith and as teachers of faith. So what can we, what can you and I and, and the imam, if he's there, what can we do that has impact on our communities of faith that is in line with both the truth and mm. what would be helpful, as Vincent would say, what would be helpful to the other? Mm. The other. Mm. Pastor, before you answer other. that, uh, Rabbi, answer the question for me. What are you doing? What are you doing well, I, in your congregation that's in line with the truth? What are you doing as a purveyor of faith to give hope, strength, and the ability of people to walk and govern themselves in a way that they know that the God of their understanding is agreeing with this? Okay, so here's here's something that I, I've tried to talk about. And, you know, I, I meet with limited success, to be truthful, in almost all things, but in this as well. And that is, I look back into the Torah, and I, and I look at this thing that they refer to as leprosy. Now, I don't really know what leprosy was then, and I'm not, not even sure if I know what it is now. I have to listen to medical people. But one thing that we understand from the Torah's tradition is that leprosy could spread. We, we could understand that. And, and we see in that world that people were scared of that. They avoided the lepers. They ran from the lepers. And there were teachers, great teachers of all of our traditions who said, no, no. And one of the things that we learned was if we put people in isolation, then it was it was a betrayal of the human. Uh, uh, it was a betrayal of the of the mark of God on humanity that we had to reach out and help people develop vaccines, develop medicines, compassion, working with, encouraging people to recongregate, even in the face of fear of what that person could spread to you. That's. I want to answer Vincent this way. I have encouraged people to come back, mm -hmm. come back into the sanctuary, come back and stand next to people, be vaccinated, wear your mask, wash your hands, but love each other as if you and I and you and I, I don't care what religious tradition you're from. I don't even care if you're secular, have regard, have regard for humanity, for man and woman and child and parent have enough regard that you not only take care of yourself, but you do it for me and for you. And that message has gotten loud and clear. I've gone beyond Zoom at this point. We all know about Zoom. I've gone beyond Zoom. I've actually asked people, pleaded with people to come back to the sanctuary safely, safely. Mm -hmm. And that, I wanna tell you, that met with a lot of opposition, but we've slowly overcome it, maybe because the st statisticians are telling us it's better now. I don't know yeah. if it's better. Yeah. No, but I, no, I have done it. No, me, I, have, me, I have faced the music on this. I have I faced agree. the music. I agree. And I'm going to, I got a comment, but I'm going to let Pastor Leaf get in there. Uh, I agree 100% with you, Rabbi. We've encouraged people to come back. We uh, know the scripture says in Hebrews 10 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, for uh, as some would do in the future. And, and uh, it didn't say why. I mean, yeah, falling away from the faith, but also uh, just the idea that um, we shouldn't uh, discongregate. The whole beauty of congregation is that we see the body of Christ. We see Christ being seen when we gather together. Um, we also encourage people not to live in fear. If you watch TV, CNN, Fox News, uh, you know, CSNBC, what that does, it just pumps fear into people. And as a man of faith, I've got to say, no, God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And when you can realize that the, the body that, that you have, the, 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 the beauty is not so much in this body, but it's the soul that rests within the body. 
you want to get soul care. Mental health issues have gone off the charts because people were isolated. You know, I can't touch somebody through Zoom. I can't touch them. I mean, you, you know, uh, yeah, I'm looking at a computer, but I don't know who I'm looking at. And especially if their screen goes blank or if they put me on, if they just put turn their screen off and they got their nice polished picture up there. Uh, no, I need to see. <laughs> While they're wearing their pajamas and, and drinking yeah, coffee. Yeah. And touch people. And so touching at the expense, as the rabbi said, at the expense of yourself. You know, Christianity spread uh, during the Black Plague because Christians were not afraid to risk their life to provide care for people who were the outcast, who were uh, considered unclean, right? So, um, uh, you know, we love our lives not to death, right? Uh, but, so, I, but I'd like to make a quick no, comment. No, 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 Rabbi, don't make me mute you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, on you later. <laughs> So here's the thing, and to answer that question, and, and I agree with both of you, the problem that we're dealing with right now, or, or churches, universal, are dealing with right now, are two things. One, they are using fear as their scapegoat to do what they wanted to do anyway. I do the I, I do the audio visual and the tech for our church, the, the hybrid service of both in person and Zoom. And I also do the numbers. This is what I found, okay? The church numbers have increased because of the combination. But also in doing that, what I'm seeing on the Zoom are the same people who generally don't come to church or come to church sporadically. As they say, you got that 40% of, 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 of your congregation and they're gonna be there. They love it, it's great, it's a wonderful atmosphere, the social bonding, the gathering of the saints, beautiful thing. You got the 40% who only come on occasions. And then you got the other 20% that you're trying to that are trying to make a decision. And that's what the churches or, or, or all of the faith houses are experiencing. And, it, and, and once we get to the point of, you know, getting people to realize that they're letting this fear thing be an excuse because if they still go to work, in, in fact, companies now aren't even giving them a uh, uh, paid sick leave for COVID. And businesses it. have opened up. The economy yeah. has started to pick up. They still go to work because they don't give the bonuses for unemployment well, anymore. Far from that main point of the pastor. The main point of the pastor, what he said loud and clear, what I heard you say, pastor, was we need each other. Yes. We need each other. We and, do. and and. Look, I go back to the original ordination of rabbis, but way back in history. We didn't say over Zoom, hey, you're a rabbi. Mm -hmm. We didn't mm -hmm. say, hey, you're Zoom helped us. Don't get me wrong. Right. I survived because of Zoom at a very crucial moment. But right. go back in history, it was the laying of the hands. The laying on of hands, yes. The Correct. Hands that one generation to the next. From rabbi to teacher to sage to rabbi to teacher to sage to humanity. It was right. the exact same thing in our tradition and your tradition. And that is that is what will save us. Because as the Talmud teaches us, in life, in congregating together and allowing the boundaries to fall, that is where you find in the human touch, that is where you find life itself. In life, there is humanity. And in on, that note, and and on that note, we're going to take a break. I'm Vincent Squire, and my three co-hosts, my three wise men, are Pastor Jonathan Leaf, Rabbi Seth Frisch, and Dr. Talib Sharif. And we'll be right back in just one minute, 12 seconds. Okay, we're on break. Email, yeah. I'm about to put your face on a milk crate. Have you seen the email? <laughs> that, uh, that whole laying of hands is called Smitha in Hebrew. And that is the traditional way. You can't you can't traditionally become a, a pastor oh, yeah. wow. with the hands. You can't. Exactly. I'm actually going to be sharing on... Test, uh, testing, on testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. You're looking day, good uh, there, you A text that talks about laying on of hands. Okay, so, it's about time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Once Iman gets settled, count us, in, count us in. Okay. You're on. Yeah. yeah there you go. Nope. You just go ahead to hold it straight up. 
You can't you can't turn it to the uh, landscape. There you go. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. I'm gonna count you guys down. Stopping at uh, from five. Stopping at three. Live in five, four, three. Okay, welcome back. And I, hey, listen, this is probably the most handsomest panel I've had all year. I've got uh, I've got uh, Pastor Jonathan Leaf, Rabbi Seth Frisch, and Iman, Doctor Talib Sharif. Um, now, before the break, um, Pastor, you made a statement. It was the congregation and the touching. It was the exchanging of feelings and emotions. It was the love that we have for one another, and that isolation took all of that away. Do you think that isolation has brought this increase in violence? I mean, we've got shootings that are at an all-time high. We've got fights and attacks on subway stations, gas stations, train stations, in the malls, in the streets, uh, you know, in the parking lot. I mean, road rage is at an all-time high. Is the isolation, that fact that we've lost our humanity and when we lost contact with people, I think it plays into it. I think social media has created a uh, a dis-social uh, community. And I think that it's because of the fact that we take one of our things that may be different and we sort of explode that thing and make it a big deal when uh, that's not the case. We need each other. We are humans. You take off one layer of, uh, you take off our skin, we all are the same. So I think that there's, a, that is, there's an agenda to keep us fearful and to keep us isolated and to keep us uh, disconnected. So what our job is, is to bring people together and that's what's going to stop it. Um, we cannot fight someone that you know. It's easy to fight somebody you don't know because you don't humanize them. But when you can talk to someone, when you can have a fellowship, break bread with them, you'll realize that they're as human, just as human as you are. And I think that's a part of this that's coming together anymore. Mm. Iman, doctor, what do you think? I think it's a combination of things. And a lot of those things are converging right now. When you look at, we had violence uh, that was happening uh, because violence was in a sense being endorsed. I mean, in terms of escalating violence, I was, you know, endorsed uh, in the previous administration, even promoted oh, to the yeah. highest office they, of the they, land. they attacked the Capitol. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. So that didn't go. I mean, obviously, if you are in a, a person that's in a marginalized area already, and you already feel nobody cares about you, and then you see power, people with power, uh, engaging in violence at the highest levels of our government, and then you got a pandemic on. You already, I already, I, I, my my needs are not being facilitated. Now we have a pandemic. The communication processes are not there, and then we and then we and then we look at. The economy now, people were out of work at one time. Prices are going up. You know, gas and everything else, everything is, all this is converging. And the, and the key thing is really, really the heart of all the protests is because people's needs are not being facilitated. Yes, there's a social need. There's also an economic need as well. You know, and what, what happened, I, I, look, I'll give you an example. I, 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 my wife and I had three children, and we adopted two additional children. Now, now, they were five years old and two years old. The twins, five, they hadn't been in school. Uh, their mother was an extreme drug case. The father was an extreme alcoholic case. They were trying to make it, but it just couldn't. I think it was over it was years ago. And uh, what happened, I, I, I had, I had uh, one, one of the teenagers used to scream all the time when he couldn't get what he wanted. So what I, what I decided to do, this is a five-year-old. Again, used to be an office with his father who was drinking. And we ended up, we ended up stopping him. going to the camp. But I, I did, I, I held him one day. I just held him. I didn't, I didn't squeeze him. I held him. I wanted him to just to see that I cared about him. And now uh, I tell you, it was revealing because he, he eventually stopped screaming and then he looked at me. And it, it, it really, I, I have to say, it was an endearing look. He looked mm -hmm. up. I'm holding him and he looked up. And he's like, he's like, he cares. And, and and we we need to put our our arms around uh, a lot of the violence. Yes, it's at all levels, but obviously the youth and the African American is off the charts. We always know it's more so now because we're not getting that arm embrace. 
The knees are not being facilitated here in D.C. The rates are real high here in D.C. Crime, there are a lot of youth. Uh, we're trying to work with them, and then we're, we're hearing from them that the you know, they, they, justification is taking place. A lot of the facilities they used to go to to get a get rid of some manager. If, if, I, if, if children automatic, youth automatically, their brains are active, their bodies are active, they got energy, they're really supposed to be done in a productive way. If that can't happen, they can't always explain what's going on, but they have to get energy to do things. And so if they don't have outlets, then of course, yeah, they translate to negative. Because a lot of these outlets have been taken away. We, we, we talk about social isolation now also with, with, with uh, community services, in the community, clubs, and those kind of things where they used to go do the basketball indoors and all kind of other things. You start cutting those things down too. And now my neighborhood is going down, it's dirty. That's, that affects me in all kinds of ways. So look, you don't care about me. My needs are not being So what happens is, it's really an unconscious protest. They're protesting. Mm -hmm. they're, kind of, they're saying, you are supposed to facilitate my needs. When that child comes here, the parent facilitates the needs, the hugs them, the food, the, the, everything they need is right there in the arms of the parent, the food. I think one I think one of our panelists said that earlier that we have to put our arms around. Okay, anybody else? <clears throat> I just want to say, um, Imam, uh, salam alaikum, and, and I, 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 I want to tell you that from what I've been able to discern from what you're saying, I hear you on, on almost every level, but a lot of your syllables were muted. I don't know if the if you uh, if Vince and, and the pastor also had that same experience with some of your words. I did. Um, did you did you guys also uh, miss some of the wording? Sure. From... Let me translate it for you. Okay. Thank you. Now I'm going to sum that up in less than a minute. We've experienced violence. We saw violence where a group of people felt like their needs weren't met because the state of Georgia elected a black man and a Jew, now giving Democrats power in Washington. And there was an epidemic, a pandemic, and they weren't getting their needs met. And the person who they thought was going to meet their needs was now on his way out of office. So the violence came in because they didn't feel like their needs were met. Now, he admitted and talked about having a uh, a, a child that he was adopting, five years old, parents were on crack, and I believe the baby was addicted, but every time he wanted something, he started screaming. And then the Iman held him in his arms, and he experienced that love where he felt his needs were being met. And what he's saying is that America right now needs a hug. Is that close? <laughs> You know, this may be the first I time I want you to know, we don't see you often enough, but I, I will say this is the first time that I've ever understood anything that Vincent had to say ever in the history of <laughs> Oh, wow. And, I, and I'm gonna credit That's you, you keep Imam. Muting me. <laughs> listen, credit you, Imam, as, as Moses who has spoken and and Vincent as Aaron, his brother. That's all, that's the only way I can understand the clarity of his remarks that they came through you. That's all. Oh, 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 oh. Peace. Okay, so thank you. I uh, appreciate being Aaron for 35, 45 seconds. So do you believe, is it possible? Okay, if the churches start preaching love again, can that... It, if, if, you know, from from every level of faith, if we go back to actually talking about love while people are experiencing so much frustration, if we go back and actually start from, from our stands and platforms talking about tolerance and faith, uh, can that change anything? Well, Vincent, we've been talking about love for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to demonstrate love. I think uh, the imam said it best. I think man to take that child who never received a, a hug like that that's what he was screaming for and i think that's what people are wanting you know the pandemic did a couple of things number one it, it scattered us it made us fearful um it uh i think it gave some people uh an excuse to not do something that they felt obligated to do before but one of the gifts of the pandemic is that we got to see what was really real what was important we got to see where the pains were, where were we hurting as a nation, and where we were hurting was in the area of relationship. We are the most connected, disconnected people in the world ever. <laughs> we, 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 
we 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 will talk to a screen without talking to a person right next to us. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the reality is that we realize that the thing that we've been sold is not true. The 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 genie or the the wizard. We we pull back the curtain and we saw it was a man on a bullhorn and it wasn't real. What's real is me and my wife and my kids sitting down and talking about what's going on in our world. What's real is me going to my neighbor and say, hey, man, we've had this fence up, but let's go around the fence. And let's talk. How are you? Who are you? That's that's what I think we got to do. Put put feet on love. Mm. Amen. OK, well, you know, lo love can do a lot of things. It could it could eat through. It could transcend. It can go over a lot of walls and mm. a lot of boundaries. Mm -hmm. The question, of course, in our own age is what's appropriate love? How do we extend that without being inappropriate or yeah. too much? And yeah. that, that's that's facing a lot of communities, not just my community, perhaps not your community, but a lot of communities. How do we now, after the pandemic has ended and there's been isolation, as the imam said, there's been frustration. There have been, you know, the ills that come with that isolation, the, the further the furtherance of ills that come with that. How do we now transcend that appropriately mm -hmm. and re-embrace our fellow, not just co-religionists, but the communities that sit right by, you know, literally alongside of us, the church, the mosque, the fire department. How do we, how, you know, whomever it is, how do we do that appropriately and, and learn anything from the isolation that we've just recovered from, supposedly? Okay. What, Rabbi, what, Rabbi, what right. I need to do is this, because we're going to shut off Comcast in about three minutes. So okay. I, need, I need each one of you to take 45 seconds uh, uh, and tell people where they can reach you. Uh, Reverend Leith? All right. My name is Jonathan Leith. Go to my website, jonathanleith.com. Jonathanleith.com. You may notice in the background, I got this book here. It says YOLO. You only lead one. Eight principles for leading yourself before you lead others. Go to my website, check it out, and I'd love to connect with you through that medium. Rabbi, you can reach me at the uh, new shul of america.org. Uh, shul is it's spelled N E W S H U L of america.org. Always reach me. And, and uh, Pastor, I just want to say this to you two Don't things. Don't make me mute you. Quiet. One thing is, we all need some of that. We we all need some of that material you've got. And as soon as I, I warned you, <clears throat> okay, Iman. Oh no. Okay. Well, okay. okay. You, you, you can reach me at thenationsmars.org. And I want to say that Malcolm used to be the leader here. And one of the things he did, he was in the community and he was visible, showing the people that he cared about them. That's what we need to do. Okay, for those of you on Comcast who want to continue, because I want to continue on with these gentlemen, because they really got something going on right now for maybe five or ten minutes. So you can go and see us on YouTube, what you got to say, or Facebook, what you got to say. So for those of you on Comcast, tomorrow I'll see you again. God bless you. So, aha. Uh -huh. That's right. We, we, we need That's to... Right. We need to go out there and not just preach love, but get out there and give people a hug. And and you know what? Most of the pastors I've talked to have already been triple, and some of them gotten their fourth vaccination. So, and, and, no, I, I, no, I like that. I like. I think America does need a hug. That was good. That, that was that was good. Oh, thanks. I got it from uh, Ema. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you got it from. <laughs> well, but, one thing that's important, if you sit down and you have coffee with somebody, Mitz, I think America could use a mug. That's what I'm thinking right now. Uh, and, and, and just, like, to, just to extend that, Pastor, I think your website should be called A Leaf of Faith. Ooh. <laughs> uh -oh. I'm writing it down. I like that. Yeah, the pun was it's truly so intended. Yes. Nice. So, okay. So, what do we do? How to? How do we show that love? How do we get out there instead of just staying from the comfort of of, of our Zoom uh, service? Um, how do we get out into our communities and express to them that you know what you're going through the same thing? You're frustrated. You're angry. Your needs haven't been met, but. I need to give you what you really need right now is a hug. Let me let me say that you, you in, in the history of the African American community, when you look at the various movements, 
crime was down lower. When we, when we, when we had active members in the community, serving the community, uh, food, those who needed food, they, they used to see they used to pass by us doing that, cleaning the neighborhood up. I mean, these are small things, but they mean a lot because they, 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 they strengthen our resolve and they strengthen our humanity by seeing us helping one another, taking care of one another. They used to see us doing that. That 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 translates to I care about you. Not not coming in preaching all the time, like they talking love. No, it's it, it demonstration. And and the, and I think I think I think I think our collective resolve as people of faith, uh, not just one congregation, but all of us together can 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 begin to take and be in these communities on a regular basis together, doing things like facilitating needs, doing childcare services, cleaning up the neighborhood. And, and we've experienced that here. We started seeing even some of the, the gang members started helping us pick trash up with something numb never do. But we were doing it on a regular basis. We got a t-shirt that's called on a t-shirt that said our community, our responsibility. We wear those t-shirts. And we want them to take ownership and say this is mine. And the more we let things look trashy, then that affects us. And we start picking it up. It's simple things, simple things like that. But we're not even if we're not doing that, then of course we leave a void, we leave a gap, and it translates to my needs are not being facilitated. Nobody cares. Okay, Iman, African Americans have lost a huge portion of that homogeneous spirit in the seventies because in the fifties and sixties we had a common enemy. Now we don't know who the enemy is. How do we get that back? How do we get that homogeneous state? You know, the worst thing that I could have ever done as a child was do something and my neighbors would see it. They would tighten me up, then take me to my mother who would tighten me up in front of them. Then I got to wait for dad to come home. The worst thing that I could ever do is see a neighbor in need and not help her or yes. help her with their yes. thing, with their groceries, sweeping their, sweeping their uh, uh, things, taking, helping them with their trash. Because I'm gonna tell you who the enemy is. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you who the enemy is. We are our own worst enemy. We have become our own worst enemy. That's who the enemy is. And some of our leaders, some of our leaders in the community are responsible. Hmm. See? Hmm. Yeah, but we you have you responsibility for that for <laughs> making them leaders. Exactly. We need we need to create a new generation of leaders. And I'm telling you, the way to do that is our best minds of our faith. Like the, the, on here right now, in, in our local areas, we find people like us, like minded people who really care to start going in the community on a regular basis, not just coming in with this opportunity to get a snapshot of those kinds of things. On a regular basis, people will begin with consistency. That's something that God loves more than anything else, just being consistent. We start doing that, we begin to see move. Again, I, I mentioned Malcolm because that's what he did. That's why he made so much progress. Right. He went in the community. He was in the community on a regular basis, talking to the people, trying to even even the Black Panthers in the back in the days that like you mentioned those sisters. They were in the community on a regular basis, setting up programs, community programs. And yeah. a lot of those members yeah. who was in the street were off the street helping out and working. They saw us helping each other. Yeah, because they were responsible for the daycare program, the free lunch program. That's what I'm talking about. Testing. Yeah, we yeah. stopped doing that. We start giving those responsibilities to other people. That's what's been happening. Well, uh, um, I don't know a lot about Malcolm, but I do know one thing that when he took the uh, the Hajj, when he went on the Hajj, he looked around and he realized that there mm -hmm. were a lot more people than than he ever imagined that would be there from every color right. and every stripe and every persuasion. And it was at that moment that he wanted to embrace all of his brothers and sisters. And I think that partially to the answer of the question is we have to do the same. We have to do the. We have to learn from Malcolm. We have to embrace people that we never saw before as our brothers and sisters, not just in faith, but as children of the living God. Well, and, and I'm going to use Malcolm as an example. And another thing that he did that I really love was he he was unapologetically honest. He did not have a problem in preaching and, and speaking truth to power. We have a problem speaking truth to our congregation. Well, Vincent, just remember this about Malcolm, a blessed memory. Just remember this. He paid a very terrible price for the truth. Every he paid man. a very dear price for the truth. And that, and that is what scares a lot of people. It scares a lot of people when you speak truth to power. 
Okay. Same thing pastor with the founder of, of Christianity. He paid a very <laughs> price in the truth. Right? Well, they all do. But, but, but uh, essentially, also, essentially also, he was alone. When we look at his last days and last circumstances, yes, he saw, he saw the wholeness of humanity. And this is one of the reasons that I'm saying that we, when I say we, the diverse, the diverse faces on here, as our rabbi said, if we, if we going together in our communities where the most trouble is and they see us together, we've embraced each other first. Right. We've embraced each other first. And now we're in the community serving the community. Every human being was created to serve and be of service. That, 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 I see it kicking in when they start seeing on a regular basis because it's their own nature is a compliment to doing good and doing things as kids. They always want to be healthy. That makes sense because it's natural for us to help to help each other. If they see us doing that together on a regular basis, picking up trash, feeding food, serving the community, as you mentioned, taking care of each other, it'll, it'll, that will become contagious. It takes a, it takes a village to raise but, a child. So if there's something wrong with the, if something wrong with the child, it means that something's wrong with the village. So yeah. Imam, say to you, and, and look, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, or as we say in my religion, I know I'm preaching to the converted already. So here's what I want to say about that. Everything you've said seems so beautiful and so right, but people are often isolated and alone when they do the things that you've just said. It's important to lead, but when you get out there alone, <clears throat> why are you working with him? Why are you doing that? Charity begins at home. Do here. And we forget everyone else. We forget the humanity because we're scared. People and that are always see evil has a way of isolating those who are doing good because yeah. good and love is very contagious. Yeah. And as the Iman said, when people get out there and see us doing, they start to do. Right. And that, that's what we have to get back to. Get back to being like, as you said, the founder of Christianity, like Christ. He served. Yeah. He didn't sit up there and give orders or bark out everything and look and stand from his tall perch. He was in the community serving. Right, right. Yeah. I think that's. Well, you said, you, said, you said, Vincent, Vincent, you said it. You said it. You said it best. We, 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 we had a sense of community at one time. And I know, that, like I said, since the time of King, we had a sense of community, but we've lost a sense of community. We know that word. We say it all the time. Come with unity. Seek to have unity. Look, I understand what the rabbi is saying. Yeah, yeah we don't hear that, but that shouldn't deter, deter us because you come into my community and you help me. Then I come into yours. And we're seen together. And the more we are seen together, working together and making progress for the betterment of that space, we all occupy this space. Share freedom space together and showing that we're responsible to make things better. If we continue to do that, then it will catch on. Agreed. It will catch on. It's a part of our inheritance. If the Lord be for me, who can stand against me? Yes. Well, you know, I often th I think Moses at times when, you know, he comes to the edge of the river, he, he's on Mount Nebo, and, and, you know, it's very clear he's saying to the Israelites, I may not get there with you. Dr. King said it. I may not get there with you, but I've been with you this lifetime. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm telling you, we're going to a promised land. I promise you this land. I promise you. But we got to keep moving forward. I may not get there with you. It is lonely. And it's going to be lonely here when you cross that river without me. But we have to lead. We have to do. But we Dr. Must. King said, I've been to the mountaintop and my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So the heck with that isolation. If you are a man of faith and you are a leader in the community, then talk the truth, plain and simple. Well, one now, of the you know, one of the you don't have to take the truth and beat them in the head, but you do have to speak the truth. Well, you Get speak it by you, you speak it by being authentic. You live it. You uh, they need to see truth. You can be truth to them. And um, at the end of the day, to be a leader, that's the price to be a leader. Okay. You know, people, people want people want leadership, but Ed. Um, Hold on, hold on, whoa, 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 hold on, Rabbi, hold on, hold on, hold on, finish, finish. people want leadership, but what? Well, they, they want the glamorous part of leadership, but real leaders 
are, are the leadership is what's done behind the scenes when nobody sees it is the sacrifices you make. I think all of us have done that. Right. right? Uh, and that's the price of being able to sit right here in front of the screen. Uh, if you're not doing it behind the scenes, then it doesn't make what you do in public anything of credibility. Correct. You know, I, I was saying, Vincent, I want to hear this. Rabbi Nachman Bratzlaff said, Geshert Sar Ma'od, the entire world is a very narrow grid. But the car, the main point, lo lefached, don't be afraid. Go forward. Hmm. And on that, we're going to close the show. So, last words, Rab Rabbi? Just shalom, peace. Salam. That's what I look for. Hold me. Assalamu alaikum. I agree. Peace be unto you all. That's what we want. And that really means we're obligated to work for peace. I'll say. Pastor. I say have faith in God and uh, work like, uh, like you'll be gone tomorrow, but believe like you'll be here for a while. Well, for those of you who have uh, extended some time with us, the reason this is called Three Wise Ones, you've seen it. I mean, sage wisdom. It's worth more than gold. And these gentlemen have spoke a lot of truth to my heart. We've become isolated. And in that isolation, we've become, some of us have become demigods. And demigods whose needs aren't being met. So we lash out at everybody. Our government, our family, our friends, our neighbors people at the gas station, people at my favorite place to start a fight, Walmart. Yet, Iman put it best. I think we, America, we just need a hug. We need to embrace love, embrace our humanity, and realize that we're all in this together. Although we're in a different boat, we're all in the same storm. So on behalf of my three wise men, Pastor Jonathan Leaf, Rabbi Seth Frisch, Iman, Dr. Talib Bashir. If it's God's will, we'll be we'll see you again. Peace. Okay, we're out. Gentlemen, thank you. That was a great show. Good stuff. You were 75% of the show, you weren't even there. You come up there and just change the whole tone, right? Oh, he knocked it out of the park. He knocked it out of the park. He didn't take long. With this I, I, I was at a big disadvantage, man. I missed 75%. I was at a big disadvantage. I, know the, I, know I missed the rev. I was in tune with the rev earlier. And I know I missed, I missed a lot of wisdom from the rev. So I got I to gotta connect with you, rev. Got to connect, man. All right, let's do it. That's great work. Well, you know, okay. listen, Imam, you know what they call in certain circumstances, what they call. Uh, imam who shows up and takes the show. They call it the hidden imam, and we're all waiting for his return. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to be at the prayer breakfast, imam? All right. Say it again. Are you going to be at the prayer breakfast? I don't know. I don't know. I, I've been so tied up, and I, I got to check emails. By the way, I like that picture with you with the president. Yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Oh, you're you talking about the prayer breakfast people with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the major. It's pe yeah, hey. it's people walking yeah, out. Yeah, 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 I'm to be there. Yeah, plan to be there. Yeah. yeah. Yes, great. All right. Hey, give give her my regards in advance, too. All right. All right. Bless you guys. Take, Take care. care. All right, Rabbi. All right. All right. Salam, salam, salam alaikum. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay, Jazz. Hey, that's it. Just mixing it down. Mixing it down. Okay. It it's a little chopped up. Um, we had some problems with the imam. Yeah. And a but lot of his audio is. He just knocked it right out of the park. His audio was really choppy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we only picked up about 15% of it, if that. Yeah, that's why I had to translate it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. good show. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, let let me know when you're ready to work on our uh, syndication piece. Uh, which piece is that? Well, we're going to uh, edit some parts of the show, some good clips, and I put it in a package for syndication pickups. Okay.
All right, I'm going to finish the AME Praise one first. Okay. Um, I'll probably work on it tonight a little bit after work and then a little bit more tomorrow and try and put something together for – I still have to complete that commercial. And then once I complete that, I probably have like another hour of work for that, not even. Um, and then I'll jump on the syndication project. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. All right. All right. Have All a right. great rest of your day. Sounds good, my friend. I appreciate you. You enjoy your day. It was happy, good to have the rabbi back. <laughs> he was playing hardball a little bit, huh? Oh, it takes a little time to get him in line, but he was yeah. playing hardball. Yeah, you just I saw you muted him. him. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw you muted him. <laughs> I Not warned right. him. I did. Uh, I warned him true. first, right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Too All funny. Right. Talk All to right. you. All right. See.